Well, Mark, welcome back to Stanford. And Thanks. from one Midwestern to another, we're honored to have you here. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so I'd like to begin by exploring your intense intellectual curiosity. <clears throat> a recent Wired article profiled your library. And instead of it being in your home, it's actually in the lobby of A16Z. Yeah. So could you unpack for us why you put it in a place open to visitors as opposed to your home? Yeah, well, so two reasons. One is if you've been to other venture capital offices, they look a little bit like insurance companies. Um, <laughs> it's all uh, tombstones of, uh, of long dead companies that they sold or took public once upon a time. So uh, we just thought that was kind of depressing. Um, <laughs> so we decided to do something different. So the, the, the message that we're trying to send uh, with the library, and it's a, a very deliberate message, uh, kind of go, goes as follows, which is, the great thing about the Valley, um, especially in our time, is the sense of newness and the sense of the future um, and the sense of audacity that there are radical new ideas and that there are new people uh, that come to the Valley all the time um, and can pursue things that have never been done before. So very future oriented and that you know, is, a, is an enormous strength. Um, Elon Musk, you know, I talks about this kind of most vividly. He describes, he says, it's, you, he says you always want to think from first principles. You want to kind of not take any received wisdom from the past, instead, you want to think from scratch. Um, and and he, he makes the argument that assumptions uh, in the past may no longer be true. And so if you rethink things from scratch, you can reach different conclusions and do things differently than could have been done before. And I think there's a huge strength to that. Um, I think there's also a big kind of problem with that, or it, it's an incomplete theory, which is um, there are also thousands of years of history um, in which lots and lots of very smart people worked very hard and ran all kinds of experiments on inventing new technologies or creating new businesses or new ways to manage or new ways to lead or you know, all kinds of things. Um, and they ran all these experiments. They ran these experiments throughout their entire lives. Um, at some point, somebody put them down in a book. Um, and for you know, very little money and for a few hours of time, you can literally learn from somebody's accumulated experience. Um, and I, th I think there's just, there is so much more to learn from the past um, than, I think the, the, than I think that we often realize. Um, and so I, you know, you, I think you could productively spend literally all your time, all your life, just reading uh, uh, the experiences of, of great people who come before. And I think you, you learn every time. So speaking of history, one of the significant elements in that library are the history of Hollywood. And I'm curious why that fascinates you and what parallels, if any, you might see to the development of Silicon Valley. Yeah, so, you know, in a lot of ways, Hollywood is very unlike the Valley. Um, you know, probably the biggest difference is, you know, in the Valley, if you say that somebody's startup is just all story um, and no substance, you know, they, they, it's a very offensive thing to say. Um, in Hollywood, they take that as a huge compliment um, because <laughs> the whole point is to tell a great story. And so they, 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 they view that as a, as a, as a clean win. Um, uh, there's another big difference, actually, which I find very, very uh, instructive to think about, which is, um, you know, we people in the Valley, we often think our lives are hard, or it's hard to start these companies, or it's hard to, hard to you know, compete uh, for the business. Um, Hollywood is much more difficult. Um, it's a much more, actually, like, hardcore, competitive, even vicious business environment. Um, and so it's always good, I think, to have perspective of people who have it harder and, than we do and still manage to pull things off. And I think that's true of, uh, of, 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 of the big successes in Hollywood. Um, the thing that they have in common is they're, you know, we, we, we in tech and, and, and they in entertainment are the two big original California industries, right? We, we, I think between, between the two industries, we kind of embody the spirit of California and the spirit of the West, uh, you know, in the U.S. Um, you know, once upon a time, there was a gold rush. Uh, then we pulled out all the gold, and we're like, okay, now we've got to make some new gold. Um, and we make it through technology, and they make it through storytelling. Um, but... Very similar entrepreneurial personalities. Um, uh, you know, very lots and lots of people. You know, up here everybody's got a startup idea. Down there everybody's got a screenplay. Um, lots and lots of people come from all over uh, the country, uh, migrate in. Almost everybody's from out of town. Um, uh, people have a real sense of what great is. You know, one of the things about the valley that I think is amazing is you. you it's impossible to be in the valley and not have a sense of what a great technology company is because you just <laughs> you have your nose rubbed in it all the time. It's like, yep, there's Google. Okay, all right, that's you know that's the bar. Um, and Hollywood, you know, and for what they do is the same thing. You know, they made they made everything from Casablanca to Star Wars. You know, all the way up to you know all, all the great movies today. And and so it's just an incredibly high quality, high caliber, high achieving culture. Um, incredibly energetic people, and you know, between these two industries, you know, California is, I think, the sixth largest economy in the world, as a standalone. If if it were a standalone country, um, uh, it would be the sixth largest economy in the world. And I think we, you know, we are the two industries that power that. So as you think about being a venture capitalist, you're taking in a lot of information from a lot of different companies, different trends. This seems to be to be a parallel to how you approach learning, taking in a, a wide variety of history and other other elements from books and stuff. How do you think about learning? How do you go about like actually figuring out what you want to focus on and, and develop? 
Yeah, so there's part of what we do. So the way the way, the way modern venture firms work is kind of strange, interesting. So we we get inbound pitches. So we get inbound 2,000 pitches a year uh, from qualified referred entrepreneurs. So kind of some you know somebody who's kind of hit the basic uh, criteria of having been able to network in the valley and been able to connect to somebody we know. And so you know it's a very qualified uh, set of founders. Um, so you see 2,000 a year, and so a lot of it is just meeting with all those founders and like trying to survive the tsunami, hmm. right? It's like I read, you know, there's all these books. There's this great book. There's a great book. I d disagree with the book, but it's a it's a very well written book called The Rise and Fall of American Growth, uh, by an economist named Robert Gordon, and he says basically innovation is over and all the great ideas have been taken, and like from here on out, it's just you know, it, it just everything's going to get boring. There's n you know no new fundamental technological breakthroughs on the horizon, and like I I would I would I would. Some days it would be a relief if that were true, um, because you know out here we're just drowning in it, right? It's just this this constant tsunami of new ideas and new thinking, um, and new people, with, you know, with, with with new thinking. And so um, a lot of it is just be, being in that fire hose. Um, uh, that's part of it. And then, like I said, I, I try to complement that by trying to be trying to be proactive. And so one is trying to explore new areas of science, in particular. And there are, I think, some very interesting new areas of science right now. Many many of which are happening right here at Stanford. Um, and then the other is it, history. I always go back to history um, and always go back to try to understand, okay, when you had, you know, a fun, oh, I'll give you an example. Um, self-driving cars, right? So self-driving cars are like a, you know, fundamental advance in computer technology. Uh, they're a fundamental advance in the transportation industry. They're obviously going to be a very big, uh, have a big, very big impact on the automotive industry, which is a very big global production industry, consumer industry. Um, it's like, okay, well, what happened, you know, the, the thing about the impact of self-driving cars, well, let's start by understanding what were the impact of cars. Mm. Right, and there were very, very interesting lessons from how cars rolled out um, that I think can be applied 100 years later to figuring out some of the some of the both the issues and the opportunities with self-driving cars. And so I try to go back and look for the patterns that can kind of be more helpful in predicting the future. Speaking of science, backstage, you mentioned that at this point in our history, 90% of the scientists that have ever existed and engineers yeah. live right now. Yeah. Um, and countering live, live and are working today. 90% of all scientists, or 80 or 90%, I think it's 90% of all scientists and engineers who have ever lived are lived and working today. So how do you th what does that imply for humanity going forward yeah. the next two decades and even the next century? Well, this is why I'm such a gigantic bull on future innovation. Um, so there's two basic theories. The, Gord the Gordon theory is basically it's a, it's a question of low-hanging fruit. Um, and so electrical power was low-hanging fruit, steam engine was low-hanging fruit, you know, electromagnetic waves were low-hanging fruit, and fr from here on out, everything gets much more complex. And so it's just, it's, it's harder, you're, you're, you're putting more, you know, diminishing returns, you're, you're climbing, climbing higher and higher, putting more and more effort in for, for less results. And, and actually, by the way, what Gordon points to that actually justifies that point of view is uh, measured productivity growth across the economy is quite low, right? And so if there were, right, because <laughs> it's basically, there's two arguments, critics of technology basically make two arguments. One is there's no innovation, there's no productivity growth, and the other is there's so much innovation that it's gonna destroy all the jobs, mm -hmm. right? And what's important to realize is they're diametrically opposed arguments, right? They, they can't both, they literally factually, logically can't both be true. Either you have super low productivity growth and nothing changes, right, on one side of the argument, or if you have super high productivity growth through technological change and everything changes. But you, you, they, they, can't, they, they can't be reconciled. They can't, they can't both be true. Um, however, <laughs> there is one way they actually can both be true, which is where things get really interesting, um, which is they vary by industry, right? And so, I, and I actually think this is the part of his argument that, that I agree with, which is that um, there are industries like technology, consumer electronics, media, retail, uh, as examples where there's extremely rapid productivity growth and technological adoption. And then there are other industries like healthcare, education, law, government, uh, where there's very little technological adoption and very little productivity improvement. Um, and so one of the things we try to do is to try to kind of navigate through the differences industry by industry uh, and try to kind of understand how to, how to apply the technology, particularly into the areas that, where it hasn't been applied before. To, to the point of jobs in our economy, you know, one of the main criticisms of self-driving cars in the future is, you know, there's five million truckers all around America. The, the role of them in the economy may diminish. You know, we see companies like Facebook and Twitter compared to their equivalent market capitalization companies in the past decades having far fewer employees. So you, you, are you of the mindset that the employment opportunities will actually increase as technology uh, proliferates? And why do you think that? Well, so there's an argument from logic, which is sort of the, you know, the, do the doctrine of free trade, specialization of labor. It's kind of well established in economic theory why that would be true. Um, then there's observation by history, um, which is we're sitting here today after 300 years of technological change, and there are more jobs in the world than ever before, right? There are more jobs in the US today than ever before. There are more jobs around the world than ever before. There are more people who are employed. By the way, income levels have never been higher, right? For, for all of our issues with stagnation of income, overall income levels across the entire population of the world are at an all-time high. 
Um, and so if technological change were going to cause elimination of jobs, one presumes we would have seen it by now. Yeah. Right. Uh, again, unless you kind of, it, it, the, the counter argument to that is, oh, but you're not taking into account like some dramatic breakthrough in artificial intelligence, at right. which point I start accusing my <laughs> opponents in this argument of just hand waving. If it's so easy to make a super genius AI robot, why don't you give it a shot? Um, we are looking to try to fund it. In fact, come in and pitch us. We will, we will, we will, we, we will, we will happily invest. Uh, it may be the last investment we ever make, but it will be a very successful one. Um, so we're, we're, we're totally on board with that. Yeah. Um, so you know, there's, 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 there's sort of the, the, the long run historical view, which I think is, is pretty well established. Then the questions get very specific, and these are some of the questions that have come up in this election, uh, this election cycle, which is, okay, the five million, 5 million people involved in driving, one form or another, are transportation jobs in the US, transportation delivery services, trucking, things like that. And, and you, you're like, wow, you know, five million jobs seems like a lot of jobs, and it is, it is, it is a lot of jobs. But this is where I think people underestimate, even with our low rate of productivity growth today, people underestimate the rate of change in the economy that happens anyway. Um, and so, and, and the thing that happens there is that what gets reported are always headline numbers, and the headline numbers are always the net numbers. And so any given month, it'll, it'll report, it just came out, I think, a few days ago, it's like last month, there were like, I forget, 170,000 new jobs or something like that in the US. And so you're like, geez, like you're not creating very many jobs, how can you possibly create 5 million? So that's the net number. It's not the gross number, right? So the gross number is much higher, um, both in terms of jobs destroyed and jobs created. Um, and so the, and the top line number there is every year in the US on average, about 21 million jobs are destroyed and about 24 and a half million jobs are created for a net ad over time of about three and a half million jobs a year. Um, and so the, 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 the real answer to the how do you replace five million jobs is we already replaced that in less than a quarter. Today, just this quarter today, just this calendar quarter with the technology we already have, we're already gonna create more than five million jobs, five million gross new jobs. And so change is happening in the economy all the time, right? And it's by the way, it's happening whether or not we elect Hillary or Trump, it's happening whether or not we have steel here somewhere else, it's happening whether or not Silicon Valley rises or falls, like the change is, the change is just gonna keep coming. Yeah. And then to me, that, you know, that, that gets back to our day job and what I think is, is, is so important to focus on, which is okay, so then it's, 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 it's saying, okay, the world is going to change, the jobs are going to change. Um, how do we set people up to be able to take advantage of the change, right? How do, how do we have change work for people? Um, how do we expand opportunities? Why education is so important? It's why uh, you know, financial services actually is so important. It's why it's so important to be able to raise money for new businesses. It's why it's so important for people to be able to move from company to company to be able to get new jobs. And, and, then, and then we can, you know, then, and then the conversation I think we ought to be having is the next hour's worth of conversation on all the things that we could do to, to, to have more people have access to all the opportunity that the new technology in many cases is creating. Yeah. You mentioned Robert Gordon. <laughs> Who else is in your intellectual diet that you turn to when you want to think about deep issues like change and, and yeah. fundamentally in our economy? So I, I have a little mental model of Peter Thiel. I have a little uh, simulation of Peter Thiel. He lives on my shoulder right here. Um, and I argue with him all day long. Um, Who wins? Uh, oh, I always win. Uh, face to face is slightly more, slightly more challenging. Um, so I'm a big believer, it goes back to history. So I'm a big believer, Charlie Munger talks a lot about uh, being able to learn, learn from the past. And he always says you wanna, the way he describes it is you wanna build a, uh, basically he calls it a mental model. You wanna build a mental model of a, of a, of a person and you wanna kinda try to understand and it's hard because these are, you know, the people worth doing this for are very smart people, and so you have to try to simulate people who, in a lot of cases, are smarter than you are. Um, you want to build a mental model, and that could be a mental model of, you know, in modern times, you know, Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos or somebody, Larry Page, Elon Musk. It could be a mental model of somebody from the past, Thomas Edison, J.P. Morgan. It could be a model of just, you know, somebody you admire, you know, somebody, a, a great philosopher or religious figure. Um, and you want to kind of construct a, a model of how, of how they think and be able to be very objective and fair where you can kind of think things through from, from their standpoint. And then you kind of, you have your own view on things and then you try to run through kind of in your head and what you know of them is okay, here are the conclusions that they would reach. Um, and if you put enough time into that, you start to be able to have these conversations, I, I find sort of with yourself, and people might look at you funny while it's happening, but you, you, you get to kind of in, in, engage in this dialogue. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. You know, the three people in the valley who I do that with most often on my shoulder, Peter, um, I think Peter, Elon Musk, and Larry Page, um, the three of them, I find push the boundaries of what technology can do and what Silicon Valley can do further than anybody else. I think they're the three most audacious people, I think, probably who have ever worked in the valley. Yeah. Um, and then you've got your models of, you know, the great, you know, founders, you know, Steve, Steve Jobs, obvious, and, you know, Larry Ellison, and many of these other folks who have built amazing companies. Um, as entrepreneurs, um, and then 
the other one for us is the great uh, the great CEOs, right? So a Andy Grove being kind of our, our our base case for that. So we're always and whenever we talk about management at our firm, we're always trying to index back on okay, what would Andy Grove say if he were sitting here today? The good news with Andy is he was very forceful uh, in expressing <laughs> his views, uh, and so there's he, he he's on the record uh, with, uh, with on, on most of the important topics, um, and is a, a very good kind of reference point for thinking about those issues. What I'm struck by is you love to engage with people who may disagree with you. Yeah. What's the broader lesson here for those of us here in business school who are thinking about these things? Yeah, so I just think, and you know, it's, again, this is the kind of thing where it, this way, in venture capital, <laughs> in venture capital. Venture capital is a funny business. Let me say why I feel so strongly on this. So in venture capital, um, uh, there's two kinds of mistakes you can make. There's a mistake of omission, uh, or there's a mistake of commission, which I invest in a mistake most people make, is I, I, I make a mistake. I, I make a decision, I invest in a company, I, I lose all my money. It's the mistake everybody kind of thinks about. And then there's the mistake of omission, which is, you know, Mark Zuckerberg walks in the door at venture capital firm XYZ in 2004. And you know, like, what is this little kid doing? And this idea is crazy. And Friendster, you know, proved that this could never work. Um, and this is ridiculous, which is what he got told by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, in the venture capital business, every highly successful VC um, has made mistakes of omission, really big ones. Uh, of companies that they, they had the chance to invest in, they should have invested in, they didn't invest in. Um, it turns out the mistakes of commission don't really, they, they matter, but they don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't scar you for life. Um, because they just they, they go, go and fade into history. The mistakes of omission, right, it's the asymmetric payoff. When these companies work, they work at, a, you know, they get 1,000x, right, if you lose, you lose 1x. If you, if you win, you, you win 1,000x or 10,000x. Um, and then the other is the companies succeed, right? The companies you passed on succeed and they torture you. Mm. Right, because you. So you who's know, tortured you recently? No comment. Um, <laughs> I can't even bring myself to talk about it. You, you, you know, you pull up tech meme in the morning or whatever your choice of thing is, and you're just like, oh, shit, that, you know, that that one again. Um, and so they just torment the hell out of you. And so, so, it's a hum it's a humbling it's a humbling job. Um, I think the same basic principle applies to much more broadly. I think the same principle, especially for people kind of in this ecosystem, I think the same principle applies to even people. That mentality applies to people with like kind of what you consider to be more normal normal careers, right? So, in, you know, as you think about having a career over over 50 years, you're going to make basically a sequence of bets, right? And you're going to make a sequence of bets of the places you choose to go and the people you choose to work with, and you're going to screw some of those up, and you're going to make a, se a series of bets. Uh, and decisions for places you don't want to go and people you don't want to uh, to, to work with, and, and you're going to make those mistakes on both sides, and you're going to have the exact same feeling on the other side uh, when you didn't, you know, when you when you had the chance to be employee number four at Google and you didn't take it, right? Like that that sticks with you for a while. Like that's that's a, that's a big <laughs> that one tends to, to, to wear on you. Um, and so um, I, I think that mentality we call it the slugging percentage mentality, which is basically. Take the bet, lose one x. Don't take the bet, possibly miss on a thousand x. Like that, that mentality is a very powerful mentality. If you're going to do that, you have to be kind of ruthlessly open-minded, right? And, and and then this is this is sort of the when I sort of view is like why when we make mistakes of omission, why do we do it? And I think it's almost always because there, we have some theory for why something's not going to work. Um, and that theory, you know, you you try to like investigate that theory, but you know the problem with human nature, you develop a theory and you tend to want to prove it. Right? Confirmation bias, yeah. right? They call it. Um, and so, uh, you know, you develop an idea and then you look for all the evidence that supports it and you ignore all the evidence that disproves it. And so you, you get locked into your ideas, right? And, and, then, and then, by the way, pattern matching works against you, right? Because things that didn't work in the past might work now, right? And, and this is the problem with history. This is why Elon focuses so much on first principles is just because Friendster, you know, didn't, you know, or Friendster, just because like MySpace, for example, didn't reach Facebook levels of scale didn't mean that Facebook wouldn't be able to. Um, and so you just have to, you have to be ruthlessly open-minded. You have to be constantly willing to re-examine your assumptions. And to do that, you can't get, you have to try to figure out a way to not get emotionally tied to your beliefs. Yeah. Right. And so I always I like to say there's a software term called, this called things, this software term called sandbox. And there's idea of like, you can run, you, you can basically run code like on bare metal. You can run code on the chip or you can run code in a sandbox. And the idea of a sandbox is it's a contained environment where if the code goes bad, Right, if it's malware, right, or if it's an AI that wakes up or whatever, you can you can nuke the sandbox, right, and and, and nothing bad happens. Um, I think we need to run ideas in sandboxes, right? We, beliefs should be run in sandboxes. Like we, we shouldn't self, to as, as much as possible, we shouldn't self-identify with beliefs. We we should we should treat them all as sort of more abstract objects, yeah. and be willing to pull them in, think about them, and then put them back on the shelf, as opposed to saying this is part of my identity. And that. it's a very hard thing. It's, a, it's an ego. It's almost a Zen-like. It's a. It's a. You have to. It's you have to take the ego out of ideas, which is a very hard thing to do. Absolutely. 
When uh, you never went to business school, you're in an audience full of folks who obviously are in business school. What do you hope that we leave here knowing both about the Valley and technology that you learned from actual experience? Yeah, so the big thing, the big thing, <laughs> the big thing. So um, it all sounds so easy from a distance. <laughs> um, it all sounds so straightforward, like the case makes it all so clear. Um, so strategy. So strategy, strategy, strategy is important. Strategy is thinking about like, okay, what are the decisions that should be made over time is, is very important. I'm going to come at particularly as, in terms of running something, right? Running a company, right? And making, making strategic decisions that affect a company. The strategic decisions sound more obvious than they are. And one is there's just a lot of context at the time that's, that's, that's missing. Usually, even in the histories, it's usually missing. The other thing I think that the biggest thing that, the biggest thing I find newly minted MBAs have a hard time wrapping their heads around is the abstract idea of what the right thing to do is in a business situation is all well and good. But as an actual manager in an actual business, you have other constraints. Um, in particular, you have organizational constraints. Um, you have constraints as to what your actual organization can do. Mm -hmm. Right, and those constraints have to do with you know your employee base, how well your company's organized and run, um, you know your existing the existing commitments you've made to those employees, the expectations of your investors, the expectations of your board. Like you, you it, Andy Grove had this sort of uh, Andy Grove had this sort of way that he described it, which is basically he said as a CEO is in place, basically on day one a CEO has complete latitude to, to do whatever they want. On day two, that's no longer true because you've started to make commitments to people. You know, you've started to tell the, tell the board, okay, here's my plan, I'm going to do X. You told investors, here's my plan, I'm going to do X. You told employees, here's what we're going to do, here's the plan. So then you get, as a CEO, you get six months in, 12 months in, 18 months in, 24 months in, and you change your view on strategy, and you go back to all the people, and you tell them we're going to do something different, and they all say, but you just got done telling us the opposite last week, or last month, or last quarter. Like, what's wrong with you, right? Um, and so basically what happens is the people who take the idealized approach of shifting strategies when it seems logical, right, typically end up getting fired. Right um, by either their, they literally end up getting either fired explicitly, their board will fire them or their investors will fire them because they appear that they're lurching all over the place and whiplashing the organization. Um, or they get fired, it's, they just get abandoned, right? Like the employees and the investors all get a vote and they get to leave um, and they quit. Um, but I'll have this conversation sometimes with founders where I'm like, that's all well and good, but like look around you, you know, you're gonna be sitting here by yourself, right? Like how do you feel about that, right? With this big new decision that you think you're gonna make. And so the, the real world constraints are very, are very, um, uh, are, are very intense. And, and they're very context specific to that company at that moment in time and kind of how it got to where it got to. Now, the response to that, a Andy's response to that was very crisp and solid, which was basically, he literally said this. He's like, well, okay, like if the, the next guy's gonna come in here and it's gonna do all these decisions, like why don't, why don't we just go outside and come right back in through the door and we'll just go ahead and we'll just breach all the, all, all the old commitments and we'll just, we'll do the clearly right thing. And, and so the, the answer to the, you know, you're the leader, you're responsible for it. The answer has to be, you know, it, the, you have to be able to work your way through it. You have to be able to break the glass to be able to do that. It's just that's much harder and riskier than it seems from the outside. Speaking of context and leadership, you ran a very successful company with technical employees, and now you run a very successful VC with a lot of partners who were successful entrepreneurs in their own right. Yeah. What are the differences in leadership you have to display in both those environments that you've learned to balance, I guess? Yeah, so the big thing, Siri is weighing in. <laughs> <laughs> Siri has opinions on management here in the front row. Um, so, so um, uh, so the big thing as an operator, what I always found as an operator, it's, a, it's like a 90-10 thing where you're spending 90% of your time making decisions. Like 90% of the time you're sitting there and like customers and issues and you're getting you know, employee re you know, product reviews and employee feedback and you're making de hiring decisions, firing decisions, market expansion decisions, financial decisions. And so it's just kind of an unending series of decisions um, all day long and then you get maybe 10% of your time to sit and think. Right? If, if you're lucky and if you're disciplined, you kind of carve out 10% and you kind of think and read and, and get caught up on, on kind of your own, your own theories on things. Um, and you, you kind of have to do that because these markets tend to be brutally competitive and if you, if you just sit around thinking, like you, you, your comp company's not going to go anywhere. Um, as an investor, and anybody who's been an investor will tell you, if you take that approach to investing, you'll blow yourself to bits, right? If, if your approach to investing is 90% action, 10% thought, right, then you're like every other schmo in the stock market, you're just churning through stocks and you're gonna, you're, you're gonna ultimately, uh, you know, as a stock market investor, you're gonna do terribly because you're gonna churn your portfolio. As a VC, you're just gonna blow yourself to bits, you'll do the first 10 deals and that, that's it, and they'll all fail and you're done, your career's over. And so, a bias towards action as an investor is a very dangerous thing, a very generally a very bad thing. Um, and so the, the great VCs and the great, by the way, great VCs, the great public market managers, the great hedge fund managers, um, uh, you know, anybody with long-term horizon, um, they seem to spend, you know, 90% of their time thinking and 
and thinking and arguing, right, there's thinking, and then there's the actual process of like all the people around you having to try to convince them of your crazy idea, so the, the, the arguing part ends up dominating. Um, so 90% of your time arguing and then 10% of your time, or maybe even less, like making decisions. Like one of the things we ask ourselves is like, how many decisions a year do we make that actually matter? And it's probably 20. You know, it's probably yeah. the new investments we make, which is about 20 a year, and those are prob that's probably it. And there's lots of things we advise on and help with, but the decisions we make, it's probably two a month, like at max. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a radically different balance of time. Um, by the way, if you've been in an operating job, it sounds very appealing because you don't have to sit there all day long and you know, be involved in all this activity and you get all this time to think and read and talk to people and it sounds great, except a lot of operators are highly right, action-oriented and their entire success in their career has come from taking action right, crisply and aggressively. Um, and so a lot of operators can't make the jump to ever being an investor because it's just too frustrating. Right? Six months in, they're just like crawling the walls. Right, like I, I'm not like they'll go home at the end of the day and they're literally like, I didn't do anything today, right? Nothing, like this day was a total write-off. I made no decisions, right? And yeah. you know that's true of 28 out of the 30 days, kind of yeah. by definition. Um, and so I'd say like mo most, I'd say most investors can't make the jump to operator because they would turn into a little puddle, <laughs> little plasma under their desk. Um, most uh, um, uh, most uh, operators can't become investors because they can't deal with the frustration of not taking the action, and so we're we're trying to straddle it, you know, somewhere in the middle. We have this. Big, this is the speech I give when we we when we we only have former founders or CEOs as GPs at our firm, so they've we have all been through this transition, and this is the little speech that I give every time, and they all tell me, "Yep, you got it. I understand." And then six months later, they're like, "Oh, <laughs> I see." So you mentioned crazy ideas. What are some of those crazy ideas that you guys are banting around in the A16Z offices that you think will define the future of Silicon Valley and uh, tech here? Yeah, so we, we go, the way we sort of go is, it's, 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 we call ourselves sort of extremists on thinking about ideas, which is um, generally like if people, smart people in the industry are gonna have figured out everything that's gonna happen in the next five or 10 years. Like I, it's, it's actually, the, it's one of the things like I, Peter, but Peter, my little argument with my shoulder, Peter. Peter talks a lot about secrets, um, and he talks about secrets being something that you know or believe that, that other people either don't know or don't believe. And I actually think like over a five or 10 year period, there actually aren't very many secrets. Like most of the good ideas are already kind of obvious. And by the way, they've probably been tried before and they probably failed, um, but the time is gonna come where they're gonna work. And so, you know, we in the industry, you know, the iPad is a spectacular new idea, except it wasn't a new idea. Apple had something called the Newton 20 years earlier. It was basically the same thing. It failed then, it worked in 2009. You know, so tab tablet computing was not a new idea. It just, it, it happened to take 20 years to get it to work. But for that entire 20 year period, it, it did look like a, a, a good new idea. So most of the good ideas are kind of out there. They're circulating or they're running, by the way, they're running in labs, you know, over here in the engineering department. Like they're already up and running as prototypes and, 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 and grad students are working on them. And so I, so that part of it is not like, and we, we swim in that world and try to understand it and all that, but like it's not that there are huge undiscovered ideas in a, with a short term time frame. So I think we spend a lot more of our time on the idea side trying to think, okay, 10 plus years out, right? The, sort of take the extreme view, mm -hmm. right? Of like, okay, it's sort of the core of the venture philosophy, which is forget whether or not it will work, ask the question about what if it did work, and then kind of push that question out as far as you can, right? So I mentioned self-driving cars. So let's just assume for a moment that self-driving cars actually work. Okay, what are the consequences of that, right? Well, for example, one consequence is, you know, potentially it, it, cars changed our idea of geography, right? Before cars, everybody has, used to have to live in the city. Cars created the idea of the suburb, right? Because you could, you could actually commute. You know, we all sit here, you know, 80 years later wishing that nobody had thought of that um, because commutes are horrible, um, right? The number one correlator to job satisfaction is commute time, right? Um, and so you've got, you know, and you see this every day. You're sitting there in traffic, you know, sitting there next to, it's everybody has the same epiphany. It's like it's 8 in the morning. I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I'm sitting there. There's a car over there with one person in it. There's a car over here with one person in it. I'm sitting here alone. Like somebody really should come up with a carpooling app. Every morning, right, every driver has that idea. And yet we all still commute, right, <laughs> in our cars. And said so, we all hate it, and so and it's all wasted time. And we, you know, we have people at our companies now who commute two or three hours a day, and it's just completely wasted time. Um, I mean, now they can play Pokemon Go right while they <laughs> while they drive, but that has that has other issues. Um, so then you say, okay, self-driving cars. Well, self-driving cars, maybe you can reclaim all that time, right? Maybe you can reclaim all the commute time, right? And so maybe all of a sudden, um, you can have the idea that maybe an hour-long commute is actually a big perk, right? Because instead of driving, what if you're, and instead of having to sit and focus and lurch through traffic, what if your car is a rolling living room, right? And what if you get to spend that hour playing with your kid or uh, reading, you know, reading, reading the news or watching TV or actually working, right? Because you don't have to worry about driving. 
Um, or what if you know? Or what if you have different kinds of cars? What if some cars are rolling offices? What if other cars are rolling? You know, by the way, I can sleep, take a nap. I can sleep. I can sleep for six hours at home, get in the car, sleep for another hour and a half on my way to work, be all set, right? Um, and so, in that version of the world, all of a sudden, maybe suburbs like are. And maybe now we go to exurbs, right? Maybe now geography becomes actually much more tractable, and we can have these urban environments get much much larger. Right, and so we're, we're trying, and then we're, we're trying to think. Okay, then back from that. Okay, what would be the consequences of that? Right, what would be the consequences of that in terms of how these companies get built? You know, what would be the infrastructure that has to get built to support that kind of thing? Right, what are the what are the kind of early signals that kind of show that that kind of thing is either starting to happen or not? Yeah. And then try to kind of chart at least some view of how the future will unfold. And so, yeah. So you mentioned a lot of us have great ideas we want to execute on, um, but you've also noted that capital is abundant mm -hmm. and opportunities are scarce. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think venture capital is only a $50 billion industry amongst a multi-trillion dollar economy. Right. What do you make of the different investment choices being made by larger companies vice what's happening here? Yeah, so this is the big thing. Uh, this is the big thing. This is the big thing I think about, about tech. So everybody, so once upon a time we had a tech bubble. Some of you may have noticed um, or read about it. Um, it, was a, it was followed by a catastrophic crash in 2000. Um, it was an actual bubble. Um, the numbers are very <laughs> clear on that. Um, uh, in, there was about four years of nuclear winter where very little happened, and then starting in 2004, tech started to work again. And between 2004 and today, it's just been constant commentary of bubble, bubble, new bubble, tech bubble 2.0, um, you know, all the way up and to the right as tech has worked. Constant, you know, sc screaming of bubble, up to and including the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, has developed a theory that tech's in a bubble, which is we really appreciate out here. <laughs> um, I think she might have slightly larger issues to deal with. Um, so, and, and, and by the way, like it, it, with imminent predictions of a crash, right, which, which hasn't happened, right, and it's every six months, imminent predictions of a crash, no crash, um, and I, I, they might actually be starting to give up on this, which I, ironically would probably be the sign of an actual bubble. Um, <laughs> in any event, um, the result of all that is, is, is exactly what you said. So all of new tech in the US, all of new tech, venture capital growth, investing, all of what we would consider to be what Silicon Valley does, total capital in is about $50 billion a year. And again, sounds like a big number, is a big number on an absolute basis. Um, it's a drop in the bucket from a national or global standpoint, right? So the US economy, uh, GDP, the US economy is, I don't know, it's like $6 trillion or something like that. Um, uh, and then just look at financial assets. The, the, there's, I think the number is now, it's like $14 trillion of negative yielding government debt in the world, right? So bonds that people have to pay for the privilege of holding. Um, uh, and, then, um, and then just even look in, in corporate America, um, this year alone, corporate America will disgorge more than a trillion dollars of cash back to shareholders, right? As I just think about it this way, like a trillion dollars of cash is coming out of the Fortune 500 that literally can't figure out anything to do with the cash other than give it back, right? Anything productive to do with it, so they give it back, dividends and buybacks. So a trillion dollars comes out, and then 50 billion, basically call it, of that goes back into tech. Where does the other 950 billion go, right, <laughs> into negative yielding bonds? Um, and so, which is why, to me, it's like, okay, everybody's like, why, why are interest rates so low? Like, I think interest rates are so low for a fundamental reason, which is the, the world is awash in capital, right? The, basically, the 20th century worked. The 20th century created enormous amounts of wealth all around the world, um, and that process continues. Um, and, um, and now that money is all out there sitting in these giant pools, primarily people's retirement savings, right? These, these huge pensions or these big sovereign wealth funds that basically represent people's future retirement. And that money all needs to earn a return of six or seven or eight percent a year to pay for everybody's old age. Um, and that money is seeking out investment opportunities and it can put 50 billion into tech and then where else is it gonna go? Um, and so I, 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 I don't only don't think there's a tech bubble, I think there's a massive tech bust, right? I think we're running a critical shortage of new technology in the world. And, and I think you can view that through a technological lens in productivity growth, but I think you can also view that uh, on a financial lens, which is there literally are not, we as a society cannot come up with enough places to productively deploy capital. And this, this is the thing, like this just seems completely bizarre. Like, do we have any problems? Yes, we do, right? <laughs> We've got like massive education problems, massive healthcare problems. We've got the big problems all over the world still to this day. <laughs> funny problems are funny. We used to have a massive global hunger problem, right? Now, of course, we have a massive global obesity problem. Um, good news, <laughs> people aren't starving to death as much anymore. Bad news, now everybody's gonna die of diabetes and heart attacks, right? So yeah. now we have, but like it's still a problem. So now we have a big problem on the other side. And so we've got the money, 
right? Mo through most of recorded history, you'd have these problems and you wouldn't be able to fund an answer to them, mm -hmm. right? So we've got the money, we can, we can fund the answers. We've got the problems, we know what we have to go do. It's the process in the middle that's kind of all screwed up. Um, and so that's where I just think, like attacks on Silicon Valley of like being bad at innovation or whatever are kind of beside the point. Even if you're right, even if, even if the value, even if the critics are all right and tech, tech in Silicon Valley is a joke and it's all just a bunch of photo sharing apps and like self-driving cars will never happen and we're all smoking our own exhaust out here, it's like, okay, so then what? Yeah. Right? If like, if we suck, okay, fine. Like, who else? Like, who else is going to do it? By the way, the Chinese are going for it. But again, there, again, the dollars, you know, there's a big tech investment boom happening in China. But again, the absolute dollars just aren't that big relative to even the Chinese economy, much less our economy. So um, and so I think that's the... It's a t it's a tech depression more than it's a more than it's a more than it's a tech bubble. Is that risk aversion on the parts of investors, or is it rational behavior? Well, it's a combination. It's a bunch of factors. Um, um, I think it's it's uh, like for sure. I think we've been in a risk. I think we've been in a risk averse equity market since the 2000 crash, which is sort of if you look at kind of the history of crashes and what happens after, right? People people fight the last the last war, and so what we know from 2000 is the stocks crash. So everybody's constantly fearful. Like the headlines are always the market's about to crash, like all the way up. Um, and then since 2008, on top of that, we now have a massive aversion to debt, right? So we're, we're incredibly uh, scared about, uh, uh, scared about uh, debt, we're scared about real estate. And it's really interesting, like you talk to, like our investors are some of these big, you know, like the Stanford Endowment here manages like $25 billion. And if you talk to folks like the guys who run the Stanford Endowment, not them specifically, but that, that, that class of people, it's just like they, they literally, they go through, okay, here are all the things we can invest in. Like, Public equities, you know, terrible performance, 2000 crash, horrible. Um, bonds, you know, we just had a financial crisis. Bonds are, are, are largely unsafe and don't yield anything anyway. Real estate blew up in 2008. You know, that could blow up at any moment. Um, commodities, you know, it looked like oil was going to go to the moon. Now it looks like the world's awash in an oil glut. The Saudis are dumping on the market for, at any price. Okay, so we can't invest in commodities. Um, you know, they go through, you know, hedge funds were, you know, activist hedge funds were working and now they don't work anymore and they're blowing up. You know, venture capital, you know, we hear good things, but everybody says it's a joke, so let's, you know, maybe we can only put a small amount of money in it anyway. And so they just literally, like a process of elimination is like, okay, where is the money going to go? And so it's, it's this weirdly perverse, like it's like I get really pessimistic about this because I'm like there's something, the transmission mechanism is not working properly, like somehow there's something between the money, the problem, and then the transmission mechanism to connect the money to the problem that involves, right, ideas, people, companies, technology. Right, management, something in there is broken. Um, but I also get very optimistic, because it's like, boy, if we could figure out how to get that transmission mechanism working better, we could go do much bigger things. And, and that, by the way, is a very big reason for optimism in the Valley, is you do have a lot of founders in the Valley now who are going after much bigger problems than people used to go after, right? Like, you know, it, 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 it did not used to be the case that the Valley would go after ideas like, you know, just with the huge efforts now going on to go after different areas of healthcare, or transportation, as an example, or even space, right? Um, you know, what, what Elon's doing with SpaceX. Um, you know, it's just inconceivable that those ideas would have been tried 20 years ago. And so th there are a group of people who do have this view that, like, we can now go do these things. Yep. Um, well, I could sit here for hours. Unfortunately, I have time for one last question for Q&A from the audience. And this is deeply personal to me. I know you have a 20-month-old son. I have a 22-month-old son. How should I raise him in the next five, 10 years to be relevant in the 21st century? <laughs> Can I get back to you in <laughs> 20 or 25 years once we find out how it went on our end? Um, like I just, I think curiosity, I mean, I just think curiosity. I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a cliche, but I think it's true, which is just, you know, whatever the assumptions are about how the world's working today, you know, so many kids just get brought up, I think Douglas Adams had this old, old line, um, he said, whatever, um, whatever existed before you're born is just like, uh, is just like uh, you know, ancient uh, and irrelevant, whatever uh, happens, um, when you are, um, whatever happens, new technologies, new ideas happen when you're an adult, um, when you're a young adult, are, are um, you know, exciting and fresh. And whenever ideas that appear, you know, past the age of 50 are against the holy order of things. Um, and it's this natural kind of human kind of view of like, you know, we, we you know, <laughs> it's weird, like history is very long. We show up, a bunch of stuff has happened. We draw a bunch of conclusions from that. A bunch of other stuff happens. And we have a relatively narrow window to have an impact on that. Um, and so I think that I think curiosity is just really, really critical. Curiosity mm -hmm. and ability to learn. Um, you know, frankly, everybody has an opinion on edu education. You know, my opinion is our, our education system is still dominated by industrial age theory of you know we're, we're creating cogs for a machine. 
I mean, not, <laughs> luckily at places like Stanford, there, there, there are exceptions to that, but uh, a lot of, like K through 12, a lot of that is fundamentally to get people to work on farms or in factories. And if you trace the ideas behind education, right, people sitting in rows in a classroom and somebody, that senior authority figure sitting in front lecturing and the whole thing, that's very kind of, you know, 1890 kind of era uh, philosophy. Frederick, uh, what's his name? The, the, the uh, mass produ it's mass production, right, yeah, applied to education. Yeah. And so I think that the thing with kids is to try to get them to the point where curiosity and learning is good and exciting and fun, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And it sounds obvious, and yet, you know, for most people, that never happens. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'd love to turn it over to the audience for some questions. Hi, Mark. Uh, this is Sam, uh, GSP uh, 2015 alumni. Uh, I have I've seen the uh, uh, ecosystem for the startup and VC have like uh, exchanged, uh, evolved uh, significantly over the past 10 years in terms of, like more entrepreneurship uh, educational resources, cheaper resources for startups and more like uh, incubator startups. So that probably make the uh, uh, competition among the VCs like uh, more serious nowadays. So I'm curious about what, what's your view about this ecosystem over the next five, 10 years and what's your, what matters most to Anderson Howitz to win in this world? Mm -hmm. Is it like your vision, your PR marketing or your disciplines on the research and due diligence? Yeah, thanks. Right. Yeah, so the big thing I think from, from what you said, that I agree with you that the, the, the startup ecosystem has changed a lot, and generally in a very positive way. The big thing that's happened, as you said, the big thing that's happened is it's just the education is so much more widely available. There are now so many more people both here in the Valley and around the world who now know how to start a company. Um, and that, again, maybe sounds obvious, but like it, <laughs> when I arrived in the Valley in 1994, like I went to the bookstore and I tried to find a book on how to start a tech company and like it was a long and lonely trip through the bookshelves. Like it, <laughs> there was very little. I mean, luckily Andy's, Andy's book was there, but Andy's book was about how to run Intel, which it was a monopoly. I didn't, couldn't really get a lot of benefit out of that for my startup <laughs> at the time. Um, and so, like the, the resources just simply didn't exist, right? And today you've got, you know, it's everything. You've, you've got, but a lot of it comes out of Stanford. So like this, is it the CS180, just the CS183 course at Stanford the, that various people have taught, Peter taught and Sam Altman has taught. Like, and, and then the fact that those classes are not just accessible to people at Stanford, they're accessible to people all around the world. And there are people all around the world watching, right, those, those videos all the time, learning how to start companies. Um, and so, th like, the information's out, and then you have these new ecosystem kind of participants, like Y Combinator in particular, which has had this big impact in the Valley. Um, and Y Combinator is now producing 240 startups a year in the Bay Area out of their, um, out of their current program, and they're, they're, they're planning to ramp that up. Um, ironically, for venture capital, um, this has all been a tremendous blessing um, because this is deal flow. Um, and so the more startups there are, um, you know, the, the, it's, it, the, 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 the pond that we fish out of is very well stocked. Um, and so we are super, super thrilled that all these things are happening because we get to evaluate, you know, a far larger number of startups per year than, than used to be the case. Um, I think the competition is m actually much more intense between the startups. Um, and you actually see that, like at Y Combinator, you'll see that, where there will be a company that will be super hot in a YC class that will, doing, be, will be doing an idea. And then, and then they'll be the bell of the ball and they'll raise money and it's all that. And then six months later in the next class, there'll be another company doing the exact same thing. <laughs> and now they're the hot company and the previous company is like, you know, what the hell? Um, and, uh, and then they compete and then they both, go, go, they both come to raise venture capital a year later and then we as VCs get to pick between the two. And so that's, it's, it's, at least so far, it's been really, really great, great for VC. Um, if you're thinking about starting a company, it therefore really stresses an idea, and again, I'll use my, I'll use my Peter Thiel on the shoulder uh, thing, channel this through, something Peter says that I think is really relevant, which is a lot of founders think about what it takes to get the second person in the company, right? The second founder or the second engineer, right? Or the third person, or the fourth person. He says that's no longer the challenge. Like everybody wants to start a company and so everybody can get together two or three or four people to start a company. He said the challenge is how do you get engineer number 20? Right, because engineer number 20, right, if they're in this ecosystem, right, they could go start their own company, right? And so how do you convince somebody to join your company as engineer number 20 with a tiny percentage of equity, right, and, and not being in charge as compared to starting their own company, getting all the equity and being in charge? Now, one of the things you do is you tell them they're gonna have the same problem, but then they respond to you that you also have that problem, and then you sit there and stare at each other <laughs> uh, <laughs> awkwardly. Um, so, 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 so that, that's the thing. So, so what you have right now is you just have, you have, you have just a very, very large number of seed funded companies that are experiments and they're experiments on their ideas, but more importantly, they're experiments on who has the will and the drive and the horsepower 
right, and the salesmanship and everything else that goes into recruiting, right? Um, and so, and, and, and every, I think actually Sam Altman gave a talk the other day. He said if you can ma wave a magic wand, you would combine a lot of these companies together to get critical mass. But mergers between startups almost never happen for a variety of reasons. And so, so it, it really it makes this sort of acute, this, this recruiting problem is a very acute problem. By the way, you think about it then as a, the temptation is to think about it as a recruiting problem, which is we have to get really good at recruiting. But it's not really that as much as it's like, OK, what about my company is going to be so spectacular and so special and so unusual and so distinct and differentiated that it's going to be able to easily hire engineer number 20 away from starting his or her own company? Um, and so to me, it basically translates into basically you, we just, we, you have to get better. Like You just have to get better. You have to be able to compete, and you have to be able to win in this really brutal initial battle. The good news is the company's coming out of that sort of churning kind of you know uh, uh, sort of uh, you know sort of snake pit of competition. The companies that come out of that are really strong because they had to be uh, to come through it. But it, it it is tougher and it is the other side of how easy it's become to start to start the companies. Thanks, and thanks, Mark, for your time. Um, my I, I have a question about the international investing. So I see uh, uh, some uh, top VCs like Sequoia, Kleiner Perkins, they uh, went to China market many years ago. Uh, but in the contrast, I think um, Anderson Horowitz uh, pretty much is pretty much focusing on the U.S. market. I want to download your um, point of view of expanding investment in investing in those em emerging market like China, uh, India, Southeast Asia, um, just like to hear about your view. Yeah, so it's very, it's extremely tempting because um, there are entrepreneurial opportunities and great companies all over the world um, and incre increasingly distributed right all over the world, literally. Um, and so it's very tempting. The, the, I'll tell you the typical problem and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the theoretical question that comes out the other side. So. So the problem is, to the extent that venture capital investing is like we understand it today, which is it's a very hands-on process of really deeply understanding. It's a, it's a people business. It's a process of very deeply understanding the people you're working with, deeply understanding the founders, deeply understanding the executives in the company, the engineers, the management team, the culture. You know, it's one of the, you know, both to evaluate the company and also to help work with the company. If it's always been a hands-on business like that, right? When it's worked, and so if it continues to be a hands-on business like that. Um, then there's a problem with geographic remoteness, right? Which is, you know, if I'm not present in another geography, do I really know the people well enough to be able to make those decisions? So then what a bunch of firms have tried to do is they then staff local teams, right? But then you, you have this fundamental problem where you have this sort of adverse selection problem where if that local team is really good, um, they can easily leave and go run their own firm, mm. right? Which is actually the exact, same, it's the exact same problem I just talked about with the startups. It also applies to the venture capital firms which is like, how can I get, if we, say we had a really good team on the ground in China, how can I convince them to stay with us as opposed to just, they could very easily go down the street, open up their own shop, raise money. There's plenty of investors in China who want to invest in venture capital. And so if they're good, um, they leave and start their own firm. If they're bad, they stay working for me, <laughs> which has its own issues. Um, and so most of those experiments have not worked. Um, it is very striking. Sequoia in particular has worked really well, and they have built a very good team, and they figured out a very good dynamic on that. Um, but it is a very tough question because you have to really dig into, okay, why did it work for them and why has it not worked for so many others if you want to think about doing that yourself. And so that, that's sort of a very, so it's, it's, a, it's a live topic or question in the, uh, you know, in, the, in, in the venture ecosystem. Um, now, there's the assumption, go back to first principles, the assumption underneath that is that venture capital is a hands-on business and should be a hands-on business the way I've described it, right? And if you, if, again, if you look at history, if you look at investment banks, you know, 100 years ago, they were very hands-on like this. If you look at private equity firms in the 70s, you know, when they were a boutique business, they were very hands-on like this. Um, you know, at one point, stock investing was probably a lot like this. Um, uh, you know, these days, in a lot of fields, it's not hands-on anymore. Now it's fully it's become computerized, systematized and computerized. And so the counter-argument to my whole theory on this, the counter-argument is I'm describing venture capital the old-fashioned way. Um, it shouldn't be so based on people. It should be done through algorithms, right? You should be able to do quantitative venture capital, right? And so you should be able to either like open up a crowdfunding marketplace and let the world compete with ideas and to be able to raise capital, which is what Angelist is trying to do. Um, or you should, there's ver there are various firms now trying to do quantitative venture capital. You should basically go gather all the data. You can look at everybody's college transcripts. You can look at everybody's past career record, you know, their LinkedIn connections or whatever data you want to look at. And you can assemble a quantitative view, right, to predict success or failure and, and invest that way. 
you know, people are trying. Um, I would say we haven't yet gotten to the point where we think we figured out how to do that. Um, again, I fantasize that somebody's going to come in and pitch us on building that as a company, and we can fund it, and then we can retire. Um, but um, I, I think like that question of of like, is it really going to continue to be that hands-on? Is 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 the question underneath the question that you asked? And I think it's it's an open question. Hi, my name is Sam Jackson. Uh, I have a question about the question of capital wash. Uh, so what advice would you have for people who have big ideas that might be very capital intensive? And a couple of years ago, I asked Elon Musk, what was his advice if someone wanted to start a new SpaceX or Tesla? And he suggested that I become an internet billionaire first. <laughs> so I was wondering if you had any other maybe easier ideas. <laughs> that is how he did it. <laughs> Not quite brilliant. Um, so. <laughs> It is actually striking. It is striking. The guys, yes, the guys, the guys who are most prone to be like, yeah, this software stuff is useless and stupid, and we should be going to space travel instead. They all started doing the useless and stupid software <laughs> stuff. So um, that 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 is true. Um, I would like to tell you, uh, th this is a, again, I'll word this as a question. I think this is a this is an uh, I'll pose an open question, um, which I, we're trying to think through, and I think a lot of people are trying to think through. But it bears. Here's how I think about this, which is okay. Like, there's a, well, there's a well-known corporate investing model, which is GE or Honeywell. You go to one of those places, or Lockheed, and they've got their big programs, and you either work the bureaucracy to do your program or not, and that's a known, th and that's where most of these, you know, big capital intensive things happen. And then there's the venture capital model, and the venture capital model, right, is sort of staging the capital over time, right, and you sort of, you, you, it's milestone-based investing, but the milestones are kind of undefined, and then you're going to a new investor in every round, and so you've kind of got this constant financing risk Right, which says, well, what if I can't raise the next round of money? And then you've got the problem with these capital intensive projects where it's like, well, I know it's going to take a half a billion dollars to get to market. If I go raise 20 million from VCs today, I have this massive funding risk of 480 million in the future. Right? And then from your standpoint, can I even recruit the team to be able to build the product because I can't even tell them that the money will be there? And then Andreessen stood on stage and told me about the 14 billion of negative yield in government debt. And why can't I get somebody to give me the 500 billion to do the thing? And so. The idea that's floating around is sort of uh, an idea to borrow an idea from actually um, how large public infrastructure and, uh, and private infrastructure gets built, which is project finance, um, which is basically like the way a dam gets gets built, which is basically, or, a, or, you know, or this is really like a lot of airplanes, airplane projects get run, new airplanes, um, is basically, um, you know, unlike the Silicon Valley, like the Silicon Valley model, we're gonna have a new idea. Um, but we're also going to have milestones. Unlike the Silicon Valley model, um, we're going to have a very, very crisp understanding of what those milestones are. Right? We're going to have a program management office that's at a level of sophistication that a typical Valley startup doesn't have. And we're going to chart out in detail how that money is going to get spent, what the milestones are along the way, right? how the organization is going to get built to do that. And it's going to be, like, it's going to be precise. Like, we're going to know week by week what all the work is and all the parts and how they fit together. And we're going to try to get to a much higher level of predictability to build the thing than a typical Valley startup would have. And then, in theory, you could then raise money. And, it, and this is sort of where there could be a new asset class and call it like tech project finance, um, where you could basically say, OK, you could go and you could raise 500 million. And, and the 500 million wouldn't show up in your bank account. Instead, enough money to get to the first milestone would show up. And then there'd be a checkpoint. And then if you hit the checkpoint, you get the money, right? And so the, the, the money unlocks over time, right? And, so, and, so, and then you could think about having a sort of a tech project finance venture fund where you could have like you could have 20 projects like that start and then you could assume that like 10 of them fail along the way and get liquidated right and just get shut down before most of the money has gone in and maybe 10 of them work and then the, you know then then the fund is big enough to fund 10 to completion but not 20 and you kind of play it like a venture portfolio so that idea is kind of floating out there and, and by the way, this is what I'm describing. I mean, this is kind of how Google X works a little bit, and this is how some of the advanced R&D projects of some of the other big valley companies operate. And so that idea is out there, but it doesn't fully exist in the form that I just described. And I think one of the really interesting questions for the future of, of, of tech is, are we collectively going to figure out a way to do that? Because right? if we can't figure out a way to do that, then the projects you're describing either have to be these flukes. Right? You, you, you have a once in a generation Elon Musk, internet billionaire, who decides to build a space company and a car company at the same time because who would do that? Um, uh, or it's just going to be big companies doing all this stuff, right? which would be a depressing answer. Mark, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you being here. Good, good. Thanks, Thanks everybody.